Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Um, it's Wednesday morning. Uh, you're you're fresh off a good old fashioned Twitter fight. I haven't been in a good Twitter fight in a while. So I'm, I'm I'm just not on Twitter as much anymore. Do you, do you say that, X fight? Are you having an X fight? I guess I am. There are excretions happening right now. <laughs> um, but I, unfortunately, the weird thing is I literally had to. Do people stop. use that? Do people use that excretions as like as X posts? Is that this, a thing? No, this, this, I got this from your boy, David Pacman. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, who in, I think invented the term. We're going to talk about him in a minute because you were on his show Tuesday, right? Uh, we taped it, it last Friday. Friday, but I think it might have okay. posted, posted yesterday. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so anyway, I was, uh, I will call it a spat, not really a fight, but you're right. I, mean, I, I almost never um, get into Twitter fights anymore or disagreements or debates because they're pretty much worthless. This was with Rick Grinnell, who's, you know, got a ton of followers and is something of a... So he, he, he was an ambassador in the Trump administration, am I remembering correctly? He was. This is a dude who had a very interesting career path. He was a um, staffer. He was at, he started off just as a staffer, as someone who was just, I think he was like a spokesman for the State Department. So th somehow he was able to, because of Trump, because of the Trump administration um, and, and the way that it, it, it allowed people who were not um, on the track to be principals, um, to to maybe skip the line if they had ideological sympathy. So he started off like as a spokesperson, but ended up becoming a diplomat. I think so he was ambassador, ambassador to, to Germany. Germany, yeah, twenty eighteen I mean, to twenty twenty. I think he might have also been like acting head of some some other so agency at some acting point. Acting director of national intelligence in twenty twenty. Okay, so yeah, um, but. So what had happened is I I did a podcast with uh, Tom Nichols of The Atlantic. Western the Massachusetts day. own Tom Nichols. Yes. And he and I had he and I had like a really good discussion. And one of the many things we talked about was how um, Americans are really more de too depressed. It was never been a better time probably to be alive than right here, right now. And Americans are depressed. And I simply tweeted a video of us having that discussion. Um, and Rick Grinnell, now, if he had just replied to, to my tweet, it wouldn't have been a big deal. I wouldn't have felt compelled. But he quote tweeted me, which means he commented and sent it out to his, I don't know, million or hundreds of thousands of followers, which I felt obliged to reply to. And basically what Rick Grinnell said, and I'm paraphrasing here, I should have pulled the clips in and show them to you on YouTube. But um, basically, he said to the effect of like, you know, why are people depressed? No one can read that, Bill. <laughs> no one can read that. I can't read it at least. Um, why are people depressed? And he said something to the effect of three wars, open borders, yada, yada, yada. An, an open attack on political enemies, the Biden regime. There you go. So thank you. Maybe you can read along and 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 help me uh, make sure I'm not misrepresenting him. And by the way, I should say, I had to quit my Twitter fight to do this taping. And so <laughs> he might think that I wimped out, but I literally had to stop fighting with him so we but could record I, on I, it. I, I think this yeah. is an important fight that, sh that you have or are having because, I mean, he's still presumably, I don't know if he's like literally working in the Trump campaign or anything, but he's definitely still in Trump's good graces, I assume. He's definitely putting forth the Trump narrative. And this is his most pithy summation of the argument that things are worse today than four years ago. Three wars- And I wasn't even making, I mean, you're making a political argument pro-Biden. I was not even doing that. I was just saying things today, people are depressed and they think things have never been worse. And it's just not true. Like, we should be a little happier, a little but less you, But you saying that, you say that it is objectively not true that things are terrible. That fully undercuts the narrative that Trump was putting out there, which is 
we're in the middle of, of the apocalypse. Yes. Or we're, we're on the verge of a bloodbath. Uh, and so here, here's Grinnell trying to paint this alternative universe where you should be terrified at the world disintegrating all around us. Three wars, an open border, an open attack on political enemies. You know, Joe Biden is some sort of warmonger uh, who is subverting democracy by weaponizing government to go after his political enemies. That's, yes. And, and, and is turning America into chaos with uh, a, a lawless border. So, uh, I mean, you know, I, I didn't even understand what he meant when he was saying weaponizing, but I guess he means going after Trump, right? Well, of course. So, what it, what it, or, or, or going after the J6 you know, yeah. hostages. And I mean, I think all three of these things, I responded to, to him with the first two, I said, like, you know, you say there are three wars. Are you talking about Hamas's attack on Israel? Are you talking about Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Because they're not really our wars. Like, mm -hmm. there aren't American troops fighting and dying there. Yeah, what's the third? I assume, um, I actually don't even know what the third is, to be honest with you. But even, even if it's just two, I don't think it's fair to say that America's in two wars or <laughs> we're not. Um, and in terms of um, the border, I said like, well, Republic, you know, we, <laughs> the Senate passed a pretty good border bill. Why didn't Republicans in the house, why did Republicans kill it? And the answer of course is Donald Trump. And then as to the point of, you know, Biden weaponizing the deep state to go after Trump, I think that's laughable. Trump committed all sorts of, <laughs> sins that um, he brought upon himself and justice. You know, there's no good time to go after Trump. You can't go after him when he's president because you're not allowed to go after him when he's president. You can't go after him when he's running for president. But of course, he's immediately running for president where he's about to run for president. Yada, yada, yada. And Mitch McConnell says you can't prevent him from being president again because he's not president. I mean, it's just a total catch 22 all the way around. So. Um, then I thought maybe it's over. And but instead of responding to me, to my tweet, Rick Grinnell does another thing because he wants his here's the whole point. He wants his million or however many followers to see him owning me or or so he has to or take what I Donald said. Trump. You might want Donald Trump to see that he's fighting the good fight at every possible yeah. uh, media figure. Uh, around, so he stays in his good graces. Thumbs up. I can't turn off this. Yes. Bring what, on the what fire is going work. on? <laughs> I, I don't know how to turn this off. Um, it's we'll, we'll have fun with it while while we uh, have fun. for those on the podcast that there's weird visual things happening with uh, the Riverside platform when Matt waves his arms in a certain way, you get thumbs up emojis and fireworks. We don't know why that's happening. It's really funny. You should go to the YouTube page and watch it. Um, it happened actually with me and Tom Nichols as well. And I don't know why it just started happening. I don't think I've just started making different hand gestures that have triggered it. I'm, there must be a setting that I accidentally set or, or they've, you know, changed something. Um, but so anyway, so I, what, think the, I think the third war he's talking about, because he when you said that on on X. Yeah. When you said, are you talking about the wars in Israel and Ukraine? He said, Joe Biden's team cut the razor wire and opened the wall. Does the Daily Beast have Google? So the third war apparently is the border war because we're being invaded. I, I guess but he also talked about the border. In the first tweet, he well, said yeah, he's, three he's, wars. He's double dipping. You know? Okay, he's double dipping. Yeah. But so the border thing, again, I said, and, he, and by the way, here's the thing. I may agree with him on some of his sub points. Like, I didn't vote for Biden. I'm not a liberal Democrat. I would prefer a conservative Republican. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't compare to what Trump is trying to do, which is overturn a free and fair election, A. And then B, again, the point of the whole video that I did with Tom Nichols is things are, things, you know, things are not that bad. We shouldn't be that depressed. Well, I mean, what you're what you're pointing to are pretty standard metrics of uh, dom of 
domestic economic growth that historically correlate with people's level of contentment. And we and we we have a consumer confidence survey that is going people's consumer confidence is going up in conjunction with you know good GDP growth, low unemployment, wages beating inflation. It's just not translating yet into higher job approval numbers for Joe Biden, or when you ask the question, are we on the right track or wrong track? You know, wrong track's been, you know, winning that fight, you know, going back many, many years, not just under under Joe Biden. So there's a certain disconnect going on with people's sense of the economy and people's sense of America and the world. And uh, Trump and his allies can't abide by anybody pointing out, you know what? <laughs> Kyle is actually pretty good right now. They have to push you off of that in some way. And and the way that Grinnella is doing it is look at these international crises and this and, the, and this border issue. Uh, and let's muddy the waters about who is really the defender of democracy here. So you don't focus on the bread and butter yeah. improvements that, that are actually so, most impactful in people's day-to-day lives. And again, I just want to reiterate, he keeps... Like, instead of just responding to me in a conversation that, that you could read in a simple Twitter thread, he keeps tweeting so as to make sure everyone and sees this, him attempting to, I don't know, discredit me or whatever. So he goes, his next point is that, like, um, he kind of has two points. One, thumbs up. <laughs> One. <laughs> Point one is is like releasing money to Iran is what funded the Hamas attack on Israel. And so it's Biden's fault. Now, look, I may agree that we should not be, you know, doing anything to help Iran. And I was not a fan of the nuclear deal to begin with, yada, yada, yada. But he are, he's sort of making the argument that that America caused the attack on Israel by giving Iran money. He also says that Biden um, lifted sanctions on the Nord Stream deal, something like that, and somehow that enabled and empowered um, Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine. Am I, am I yeah. misrepresenting this? No, that's what he said. But these are obviously uh, incredibly specious and tenuous connections that he's making that is he going to is he going to blame Netanyahu for uh letting Qatar give money to Hamas? Uh, of course not because that doesn't serve the narrative he's trying to put forth. We don't we don't even have evidence that Iran was directly involved in the Hamas attack. I mean obviously Iran gives Hamas money, uh but there's no indication they were involved in the planning of it. Uh so but he but all, I think all, all those sub arguments are n- Th- th- those are ways that when you're pressed, whether it's an X fight or whether you're on cable TV or what have you, it's a way to kind of sound smart. You've pulled yeah. this, this data point out of your ass, and now it seems like you have a better. You know, he, he said you like you don't know anything about foreign policy, Matt. I look, I I pulled a couple data points and shoved them together. I must know something about foreign policy. Uh, and if you're not prepared for it, you might be destroyed. Like... Maybe that maybe there is some sort of connection that I didn't know about. But he is brazenly cherry picking data points that disregard a whole lot of other, you know, journalistic reporting about what actually happened here and ignoring other data points uh, that don't fit fit the narrative, like Israel's decision to let Israel's belief, the Israeli government's belief that by letting Qatar give Hamas money, they were keeping them at bay and and ignoring the military plan that that was going on that led to October 7. Uh, That stuff doesn't serve the narrative, which is Biden is the sole cause for everything bad in the universe, as if there's never been a, a problem in the Middle East before Joe Biden. There's never been an international crisis before yeah. Joe Biden. That and he's Russia to blame. didn't violate uh, sovereignty of other countries before Joe Biden when they, they did on George B- W. Bush's watch and did on Barack Obama's watch. Uh, yeah, you know, this is like saying that George H. W. Bush is to blame for 9/11. Right. Mm-hmm. Or Reagan is to blame for 9-11 um, because his administration funded the Mujahideen. Mm-hmm. And you know what I'm saying? Like you you can look at in some cases, they're not even mistakes. 
but at things that happen that ultimately lead to unintended consequences. Um, but it seems, yeah, it seems a, a bit of a stretch. And look, and here's the thing. Even if I agree with Rick on some of these points, like, yeah, this wasn't a good idea. Yeah, that wasn't a, like, it does nothing to erode my fun. The whole, the, my original tweet that started this was simply saying, things aren't that bad. <laughs> We've had a lot worse times in America. <laughs> Don't be so depressed. That but, was, but this, yeah. but this is the battle for 2024, you know, in, you know, micro form. Donald Trump has a frame, which is that everything has gone off the rails under Biden and everything was really awesome under me. And that that requires you to cherry pick particular developments in the world today at the exclusion of everything else that's going on that's that's that's, that's otherwise positive. And it requires looking only at the economic data and nothing else from 2017 to 2020 uh, and ignore 2020 completely. So it's a really brazen cherry picking endeavor, but Trump, the, one of his strengths is that he, he can be, uh, he, he, he has no shame. So he can cherry pick at will. He, he's consistent staying within that frame. Uh, and uh, uh, and we've seen some some benefit from him. You do see his approval of his presidency is higher now than it was at any point during his presidency. Uh, and so when I when you mentioned I was on Pacman the other day, and I've talked about it here at DMZ, and I was I was talking about it in a little more detail with Pacman. If you want to watch that, uh, it's why I think it's very important for Biden to have a superior frame to hang his data points on. It's not that he is devoid of framing but i don't think a, and i hate to be super nitpicky but yeah. i believe that the proper frame is 2020 and not so much the pandemic 2020 but cities on fire in 2020 rioting yeah. in the streets protesters let, let, being let, shot leading to the insurrection in 2021 these are things that are one the I, I think we do have some memory of this. It may be a little suppressed because uh, we, we tend to romanticize the past. But you can re remind folks, I think, fairly easily, things were really out of hand in 2020, well beyond the pandemic, which you, which I do think is sort of a complicated issue to relitigate. Yeah. Um, although there's, there are well, things you can let say. Me, let me the, jump in, Bill. And sure. So it seems to me like what you're suggesting is like an overarching narrative, a story to be told about politics today and of the last five years. And rather than engaging in little, like responding to or engaging in little debates, uh, Trump said this, let's talk about that. Trump said that, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing that, that's kind of playing small ball. Everything goes back to this dominant frame, this dominant right. message. And so rather than talking about was, when he said bloodbath, did, was he talking about the auto industry or was he talking about violence? That's small ball. If you're debating that, you're losing. So what Biden should really be doing is taking that, bringing it back to the master frame, for lack right. of a better word, the Wait, dominant if the, if, narrative, right? If the master frame is... Donald Trump's uh, the Donald Trump on a daily basis pits Americans against each other in service of his political ends, uh, and we see how that ends. That ends in cities on fire and a literal insurrection. That's what happens when you put a guy in the Oval Office who spouts this kind of hatred and vitriol on a daily basis. And so anything that he says, that is, whether it's, again, whether it's over the line, a little bit behind the line, you don't have to debate the intent or the meaning of it when you put it into that larger frame. It doesn't matter what he meant. We know what the impact is. We've experienced it. And today, American cities are not burning. And Biden supporters are not 
plotting insurrections. Uh, so you know, they want to create a, a frame of chaos pointing to Israel on the border. And honestly, uh, I, like, as I said, I do think they've, they've had some success in doing that. I don't want to be uh, blind to that fact. But historically speaking, a growing domestic economy is far more salient in determining the outcome of an election involving an incumbent president than immigration, than an international crisis that does not involve American troops dying. Uh, so I think Trump's got the harder job directing your focus elsewhere. Yeah, Biden has the easier job uh, to say, our economy is on the right track. And he has the added benefit of running against a president who was unpopular while he was president. And we just need to get back to reminding folks why you why you didn't like him in the first place and, and, and how badly that presidency ended. So I, I, I think there are a lot of things that Biden has he can work with. I mean, the challenge for Biden, there's, there's, there's two main challenges. One is he has to be president. And there are things that happen that don't fit the narrative that he has to deal with. So he can't just be he can't just do rally after rally the way Trump can, although Trump has his own distractions having to be in courtrooms and also apparently on the golf course, which is a waste of his time. But apparently hey, he's doing a fair amount Let of me that. just say he won two different championships <laughs> this past week. That is impressive. <laughs> uh, so Biden has the difficulty of having to be president. Um, uh I, I, I've lost my train of thought, but the, the I was sorry to interrupt, but it is impressive that he won these two. And now, granted, it was his own golf courses, but still, um, he is a, he's obviously a great golfer, maybe almost as good as, as Kim Jong Un, who I, I understand is quite good at golf too. Um, so I have, you know, I don't have a dog in this fight. I mean, I'm a homeless, politically homeless person, and I think the Biden narrative um, is the truer of the two narratives, personally. So it should be an easier sell. But one of the other things Tom Nichols and I talked about on our discussion was, how is it that Joe Biden isn't up by 40 points right now? I mean, you've said it's an easier sell. And then you've got all the stuff that Trump has done, obviously, indictments, criminal counts, impeachments. Um, obviously, Biden's not able to sell this framing that that you, I think that well, you are I, correct. I, I think it's a premature assessment. I mean, I, I, again, there are innate challenges. When, when you're an incumbent, uh, things happen at home and around the world that are out of your control that you got to deal with. You can't, you can't always be on message all the time. Uh, and uh, as you know, even Reagan's people understood in 1984 with a 24-7 news environment there is a tendency towards negativity in the discourse that you have to push back against. Uh, and Biden in particular did have a period of very high inflation in 21, 22, starting to cool in 2023, that has some residual effect. Uh, so that is something that, that, that there, and there's, and there's often a lag between the economic improvement and people really internalizing and feeling the economic improvement and feeling better about things. Uh, but we did, did see a couple of polls that came out this week where Biden showed some improvement. Uh, so we need to see more of that to see if that's not just, you know, statistical noise. Uh, but it makes a certain amount of sense. Like the past month has not, ever since State of the Union, we have not had a drumbeat of stories about Biden falling apart, about Biden being decrepit and, out, and, out, and, and, and losing his cognitive abilities. That that narrative has been muted in the past two three weeks, uh, and and you've had I think a bit more coverage about you know Trump's legal uh, issues. So, uh, you, and also immigration has been I think a little muted in the past couple of weeks. So the, the numbers are going down down a bit. So uh, it's it's too early to say that Biden. You know, this was the Ezra Klein argument. You know, a couple months ago. Biden has shown that he can't do this. He's not up to this task. Well, maybe just because there are things in the environment that made the task a little harder at this point in time, but news developments can change and Biden can turn up the, can crank it up to 11 when he wants to. Uh, and, uh, and, there, and there is some 
fluidity in the electorate. There's a lot of folks who are hard and are not going to switch sides, but but there is still a, there still is a middle. There still are low information swing voters that don't tune into the news every day, uh, and they might not really lock in until September or October. Uh, so uh, I so long as the economy stays on this clip, you know there 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 is a, this thing called uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta does a a running uh, track of GDP growth. They call it GDP now. So that they're projecting out where the GDP is going to be formally reported at the end of the quarter. Uh, and it doesn't mean that what they say right now is going to be, I mean, it moves. Um, but it hasn't been that wildly off. Right now it's at 2.1%. You're not a gangbusters GDP number, but fine. Uh, and fine is probably what Biden wants right now, because if it was too high, that might kick up inflation all over again. You kind of want that not too hot, not too cold. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, if the first two quarters of election year GDP are positive, that's a leading indicator. So you tend to feel that in the following quarter, by the time you get to election day. So if we're around like two, three percent uh, in the first half of the year, that's a, that's a good that's a good landscape for Joe Biden to run in. Before we move on, Bill, um, I thought you did a really good job with Pac-Man on talking about how I'm going to go back to this because it's so fundamental. You have this narrative, this message, this frame, and whatever is happening, you can apply to that frame. And you did a really good job of talking about the. Um, bloodbath, but then you also tied in anti-Semitism and, and yeah. demonstrated how whatever the issue is, it can all, often be brought back to this kind of theme, for lack of a better word. Uh, expound on that, if you would. Well, because well, I, I, I don't feel like the Biden campaign has the proper frame nailed down. And when you don't have a good frame mm -hmm. nailed down, you you when you react in the moment, you might go in a place that's not ideal. So Donald Trump says that uh, if Jews who vote Democratic hate their religion, hate Israel. And so the knee-jerk reaction to that is Trump's being anti-Semitic. A lot of Democrats uh, make that case. When Republicans were asked by, various Republicans were asked by reporters, do you agree with this? And you, you did, and you saw a lot of Republicans say, "Well, you know, I might I might not have used those words, but he was, you know, he's still basically correct. I mean, Democrats really do have a, seem to have a problem with Israel these days, uh, and you know, Biden's really being pulled in that direction. Uh, and so now you're debating, you know, you're debating what what did Trump mean? What is yes. the definition of anti-Semitism? These are all things that are far afield from what should be the issue of 2024, which is the Biden record versus the Trump record. And the Trump record is Americans turned on each other and lit our cities on fire and tried to overtake the government and, and, and for the election. That is how the Trump presidency ended. So if you're always talking about how Trump's vitriol turns Americans against each other, here's Trump trying to turn Jews against Jews. That's the that's the more important thing than whether he's anti-Semitic or not. It's it's a little tricky to call him anti-Semitic when he's defending Israel. So it, it, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's wrong to say it. I'm saying it's 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 a more messy argument that Trump is literally trying to turn Americans other, other Americans is a literal truth. I mean, it's it, there's no debating about that. That's literally what it's he's the doing. Fundamental truth too. Yeah. With, with 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 known consequences, it's not 2016 where we can talk talk about. Oh, should I take him literally or seriously? Maybe he says these wild things, but it's not going to really matter in practice. We know how it matters in practice. We saw it happen, and our cities were on fire. I think you're totally right. I think once again, you should be running the Biden message. <laughs> And I, and I know um, David Pakman asked you about this and you acknowledged that it's easy to be a, a pundit. Um, I would say, no, it's hard. We may have the <laughs> toughest job in America, but it, we're whatever. The, we're the true heroes. But, well, you know, let, I'll let, let me segue to another, another issue that I think has some relevance to this question, the Ronald McDaniel uh, yes. flap. 
Uh, so here is the former RNC chair who flacked for Trump during all the election denialism nonsense, who got forced out by Trump, uh, presumably because she wasn't fundraising well enough. A classic example of, you know, avoiding where the blame really belongs, the guy at the very top. Well, yeah, on, appara on apparently um, it was that she allowed the primaries to happen. That was the thing that really. Well, that's even stupider Trump. because he's, I mean, how is she supposed to prevent a primary? Like, he's not even, a, I mean, he's not the incumbent. There are other candidates in the race who had campaign committees and raised money. Of course, there's going to be a primary. Um, so, uh, completely ridiculous. So here, here is someone who's potentially a, a, a disgruntled former employee who might be a little freer to talk. She had snapped up by NBC News to be a paid contributor at a, at a fat salary. Uh, and she's on Meet the Press, apparently an interview that was booked before she was a paid contributor. And Meet the Press didn't know she was going to get hired. Uh and she does a lot of things that are sort of classic Republican on message stuff, but she does volunteer that she doesn't agree with Donald Trump uh, when he says that the January 6th uh, convicted prisoners are hostages. Do you um, want me to roll the tape or do you want to sure, just describe yeah, roll, it? Roll, roll tape. All right. Let's go. Right, I got a couple tape. tape. This one's kind of long. Uh, this is the Meet the Press segment. And then if you want, we can do Chuck Todd responding. <laughs> Trump says one of his first acts, if he is reelected to a second term, would be, quote, to free those charged and convicted of crimes related to January 6th. Do you support that? I want to be very clear. The violence that happened on January 6th is unacceptable. It doesn't represent our country. It certainly does not represent my party. We should not be attacking the Capitol. We should not be having violence. I said it that day. I put a statement out that day that this is not acceptable. If you attacked our Capitol and you have been, have you, and you've been convicted, then that should stay. So then, but to the question though, do you disagree with Trump saying he's going to free those who've been charged? I convicted? do not think people who committed violent acts on January 6th should be freed. So you disagree with that? He's been saying that for months. I, Rana, why not speak out earlier? Why just speak out about that now? When you're the RNC chair, you, you kind of, take one for the whole team, right? Now I get to be a little bit more myself, right? This is what I believe. I don't think violence should be in our political discourse, Republican or Democrat. And I disagree with that. I agree with him on a whole host of other things. Let's close the border. Let's make sure we have good incomes for people. Let's make sure we do a lot of great things. But on that point, I don't think we should be freeing people who violently attacked Capitol Hill police officers and, and, and attack the Capitol. Rana, that is such a fundamental point. People would argue such a fundamental point to our democracy. You say you still support him. I assume you're still going to vote for him based yes. on that. What do you say to those who hear your answers to that question and feel like it's hypocritical to then vote for him? Yeah, I, I think we have to make a choice, right? And everybody is looking at their candidates and they may say, I don't love everything about this. I disagree with this. I don't like how they say this. But for me, when I look at my state of Michigan, and I look at the, the cost of food, the cost of rent, the cost of insurance, that I feel less safe. So, crime is on the rise, that we're seeing fentanyl come across our border, that we're seeing an open border. I don't think there's any choice but to vote for the I Republican. Even though you may have disagreements, it's him or Biden, and that's the truth. There you have it. I think that really uh, harkens back to the Rick Grinnell. <laughs> Controversy, well, right? But but the focus on where she goes off Republican message, like to me, that was the most important thing. I don't care if Ron McDaniel is a good person. I don't care whether or not she's a hypocrite. I don't care whether or not she lacks moral courage. I'm not voting for Ronald McDaniel. Uh, that's not the choice before voters generally. The question is, can uh the challenge for the Biden campaign is to remind folks how awful Donald Trump was, how he turns Americans against each other, and what that resulted in. Here's Ron McDaniel giving you some fodder to that point. Yeah, she she wants to sort of downplay it 
and say, well, I'm still going to vote for Donald Trump anyway. Well, who cares? You don't, you, don't, you don't have to show the entire clip when you talk about this. You can show the, the part of the clip that's really relevant and say, even the former RNC chair knows that the January 6th prisoner should be in prison yeah. and should not be party. Um, but, but I would also, I think you're right. But I would also say she is, so, so first of all, She's making allegations that things are horrible, worse than they've ever been. That crime is so bad, inflation's so bad, and all this. Well, that crime actually isn't that bad. I don't know how it is in Michigan, but as we've discussed here, violent crime is way down in major cities, generally speaking. Um, so she's making false assertions, overplaying how bad things are. Um, and but even if things were bad, are they worse than trying to stop the free and you know overturn a free and fair election and stop the peaceful transfer of power? How bad would things have but, but, to? How much would all, eggs have to cost for me to prefer that? But I over, don't have to debate that with Ronald McDaniel because Ronald McDaniel's not the candidate. What all that she says that was on message for a Republican is totally overshadowed by what she said that's off message. However, what overshadowed all of that was what Chuck Todd said after the interview. <laughs> do, do you want to play that clip? Let's, let's, let's roll the tape. You the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation. Because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. So I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Mm. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this, because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. So it is, it, you know, that's where you begin here. And so um, when NBC made the decision to give her NBC News's credibility, you got to ask yourself, what does she bring NBC. That was just a I, I, segment. I don't really like Chuck Todd's critique. Um, so, so, so I have two things to say. One, what I think is most important for the election, if you're, for, if you're, if you're a partisan, I think the more important thing was, hey, you found you found a Republican way to go off message. Sometimes you use use the fire she's giving you and ignore the rest. But as far but because so many people who are extremely online are so focused on media criticism and a belief that the, the media, like media narratives do have relevance, but a point can be overstated. But so many people, are, they are much more interested in watchdogging media industry decisions because uh, they have because they have narratives about the media industry that they want to uh, put forth. Chuck Todd gave them a giant flaming bag of fodder to work with <laughs> by having someone from inside the Citadel, you know, you know, talk trash about uh, his own bosses uh, on live TV. Uh, but the substance of Chuck Todd's critique confuses me because she's hardly the only person with a paid, you know, pundit contract. <laughs> Coming from a partisan background that you might have to wonder, you know, what does she really believe here? She's still not the first person to uh, gaslight with, you know, pre-cooked messages. Uh, uh, I grant that she is perhaps maybe one of the worst practitioners of this being a member of Trump's RNC. But if that's the standard we're talking yeah. about, there's a whole lot of people I would fire, not just Ronald McDaniel. Well, the, the thing she's lying about or changing her tune about is whether the people who stormed the Capitol are hostages or criminals. So it's, but I, I agree, you can't, well, you can't. I know what she believes, what she just said. She, she was clearly being phony when she's the RNC chair because she's a paid partisan. And now she's copied to the fact that she was do, doing spin when she was RNC chair is now like it. No, but I, she, look, I agree that this is not the major point to be discussed. But I think what Chuck Todd is saying is we're now paying her and she's going to want to fit in here. She's going to want to be acceptable to us. So maybe she's telling us what we want to hear the way she told Donald Trump what he wanted. Well, then, to well, then she wouldn't have been so unmatched with everything else. 
I mean, look, I, I, I don't look at anyone <laughs> in the pundit chair, particularly if they have, if they have a partisan background, thinking this person is giving it to me absolutely straight all the time. There's, there's, there's no. I mean, everybody, almost everybody spins. That's why I mean, when you and I talk. We get accused of spinning, even when we're not, because so many other people do it. Because they yeah. assume well, that's what we, we, we all do every I don't be... shred of commentary that we have because we have uh, a desire for a certain political outcome, and we never could be giving it straight. Yeah, uh, no, I don't want to. I don't want to be obsessed with the latest, you know, personal controversy. But like when I say what's so bad about America and that things are pretty good, I could have said that ten years ago. <laughs> Five years, like five years ago, like it wasn't my agenda was not. And I realize you're pointing out that me saying that fits very well into Biden's current framing and really hurts Trump's current framing. That was not my point of bringing it up specifically. I mean, we were talking about, you know, why is it? It seems weird to me that Biden is so. All Trump has been so erratic and crazy and bad. And that Biden isn't winning by more. But like, I have long felt for probably four decades that we, the news media, talk, all we talk about is how bad things are. But like, there's never been a better time in human history to be alive, statistically speaking. Like, I was saying that, and it's not just me, there have been many books have been written about this exact topic, right? But some um, people might argue, well, you're just saying that because you hate Trump and you want people to... Uh, believe this artificial narrative. I mean, everybody can be accused of having an angle. And many, many, many people who have paid pundit contracts are people that came out of either literal partisan professions, working for a party or as political consultants, or from ideological magazines and have ideological yeah. views. Look, uh, George, and, George Stephanopoulos is a classic example, right? right. He, he was Clinton's press secretary and he walks mm -hmm. into a job, you know, basically being a host of a Sunday morning show, not even a commentator, but a host. <laughs> Chris Matthews works for Tip O'Neill and Jimmy Carter, gets his own show on MSNBC. Bill Moyers works mm -hmm. for Lyndon Johnson. I mean, I've long as a conservative pointed out that these jobs by and large were not available <laughs> to Republicans and certainly not in the degree. We could, we could find examples. William Sapphire, you, know, you can find examples, right. but like, well, like but you, you watch these people because, one, perhaps they have interesting things to say. Uh, two, maybe they will say different things than they did when they were uh, on the payroll for a party or a candidate or for an ideological publication. Uh, and to the extent that that's true or isn't true, you as the viewer, you should be an educated viewer and take everything people say with a certain grain of salt and think critically for yourself. Uh, who, who was arguing that NBC was blessing every utterance out of Ronald McDaniel's mouth because she has a paid contract. Because if that was true. Be, do, they, do, they, do they sign everything Hugh Hewitt says? I think he still has an NBC contract. Well, look, I mean, he's I probably Chuck more Todd, a partisan figure than McDaniel, McDaniel is at this point. And he's defending her. He's saying she's going to sue people for <laughs> libel and defamation. I don't know if you saw that clip. Um, but the other thing Chuck Todd said, which I think is the true reason, is that there are a lot of journalists at NBC who were attacked by Rana McDaniel, you know, and and the Trump administration. They were called fake news. Um, and, and Rana was a participant in gaslighting journalists at NBC and at, in some cases, impugning their integrity and, and, and their, you know, uh, honesty. And so I think that's the real thing. Why should we, why should our institution give all this money to somebody who, like, not only were they a part of, you know, trying to stop the peaceful transfer of power and have these fake electors, but also has attacked us personally. Why are we going to reward that hey, look, person? I, I, and I get that. Like, I, I don't fault them for expressing uh, that concern and being unimpressed with her background and say, why, why her and not somebody else? Why is $300,000 going to her and not somebody else? I mean, those, those are all fair points. I'm not, I'm not saying that they're unfair. Uh, I'm saying on the things that I'm personally concerned about at this time in my life, that is super low on my list. Uh, and uh, the fact that she, I mean, 
you know, I saw that she was hired. I didn't know what she, what she, what she, what she going to bring to the table. You saw, I saw her wondering, you say, okay, maybe she's going to bring a little something to the table. Maybe she's going to do a little something that's off message that might add something to the conversation. Uh, and from my own selfish political interest, uh, could what will be helpful. Uh, so like that was my gut reaction to it. Uh, and instead we're having, you know, three days yeah. of conversation about the veracity of Ron McDaniel, which I just don't care about because she's not on the ballot for me. Yeah. Okay. So in fairness to Rana and I, literally sympathy for, you know, I'm pl- literally playing devil's advocate here. Right. But in fairness to Rana. So I remember Stephanopoulos, his big moment was he was the first person to use the word impeachment in regards to Bill Clinton. So he's like on a round. I believe that's true. He was on a round table. So the early. Monica Lewinsky scandal is broken. And Stephanopoulos gets to show his independence by using the, the I word. I think that's right. With Rana, her first interview out of the gate, she actually isn't being treated like a commentator or a pundit. She's not. She, she could have been on a round table with, you know, Steve Hayes and all these different journalists, even Chuck Todd. She could have been on the round table. And the question could have been, Donald Trump just said, did something new. What do you think, Rana? And she could have thrown him under the bus. But instead, she's in this one on one interview and it's about her. The whole point of that interview is to relitigate the past and to get her to basically admit she's a hypocrite or to, to either either she has to stick by and defend the indefensible or she has to basically admit that everything she used to believe was bogus and wrong. That's well, not is, a great. Well, this is and, and I get why you have to do that. Right. If, if you're the host of Meet the Press. You, you maybe you feel like you have to like that start off that way, but there, it was it was set up for her to fail. Yeah, the whole thing was mishandled by NBC Brass. Uh, the fact that McDaniel was hired without looping in people in advance and sort of taking the temperature like if they took the temperature in the newsroom first, maybe they wouldn't have done the hire at all. They would have avoided yeah. all, all this controversy. Um, and you know, I, you know, I don't. I'm not arguing that. They have some sort of obligation to hire Ron McDaniel. They most certainly do not. There's plenty of people they could have hired. Uh, uh, and then once you did it, I don't know if it was NBC executive suite or beat the press. Someone should have raised their hand and said, wait, I just booked this person before this deal on a different grounds. Can we rethink this segment now? Because if she's a paid commentator, this is a different sort of interview. Uh, I mean, we don't usually do one-on-ones with our paid contributors. They're 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 part of roundtables and part of discussions. Yeah. So, what are we doing here? Uh, it's weird that they didn't have that discussion in advance, and instead, sort of plowed ahead and then let Chuck Todd come on and embarrass everybody in the executive suite. I'm blown away. I've been a part of a lot of organizations, and I'm blown away that you almost never are asked. So, I worked at. <laughs> I worked at an organization that we went around the country uh, training activists, and we did a class in in Houston. And I was there running this little seminar, and there was like a middle a middle aged woman who attended it, very nice. Um, and uh, she insisted on driving me to the airport the next morning, and I'm like, "That's okay, you know what? I'm one of the, I, I'm." one of those freakish people I love to get to, I have to get to the airport two hours earlier. Like I'm, I'm not comfortable. And she's like, don't worry, I'll be here. And I'm like, it's really, you don't need to do that. I'll order a cab. This is before Uber. She insists, right? Never shows up, never returns any <laughs> phone calls, nothing. Just disappears, totally ghosts me, right? Six months later, my company hired her to be a vice president and no one it's it's known that she attended this seminar that i helped conduct it's you know you just have to like look in her little file no one bothered to even ask me what did you 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 spent a weekend in a classroom with this person what did you think of this person and of course they ended up firing her you know within a couple of months because she's utterly incompetent but (laughs) you could have asked (laughs) <laughs> Could have run it by me. It never, they almost never, I've, I've maybe once or twice, someone's been like, hey, we're thinking of bringing so-and-so on. What do you think? 
But like chemistry is so important. I mean, and, I mean, and, I mean, and yeah, they should. I mean, obviously, NBC News, which includes MSNBC, has a is a pretty heavy liberal rank and file. Hiring the former RNC chair who was flagging for Donald Trump, you have to know that's going to cause some kind of internal controversy. You would, I mean, sure the average pundit hire you wouldn't do that, but this is clearly yeah. a different case and deserved more, uh, more vetting and more discussion. Although I'm sure part of the calculation was, you know what, we really need to have some more Republicans in the stable so we can have some kind of balanced discussion on some of our platforms. And I know. These MSNBC tips aren't going to like it, so I don't really care what they have to think. We just got to we we just, we just needed to have some balance here, so let's just let's just do it. If, if you're going to do that, then be prepared to take the heat and tell everyone to sh- go go pound sand, uh, which they yeah. clearly weren't prepared. They probably weren't they probably weren't inviting Chuck Todd to join the ramparts. Uh, that clearly change changes the equation for them. By the way, I made the flight. I made my flight on time. And that's why you that's why you leave early. That's why you get that's why you plan to get to the airport a lot way in advance. Because something could happen. You could get the flat tire. You could have Karen who doesn't show up to pick you up at the you know at the at the Marriott uh Houston, whatever. So you plan accordingly, you still make even if something goes wrong, you still make the flight. You know, I'm on a, I'm on deadline today. We've been talking for a bit, but do you want to get into RFK for a little bit before we wrap up? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Let's let's end let's end with that. So I wrote about this for the Washington Monthly Newsletter yesterday, and I'm writing about RFK Jr. far more than I want to. I really wish we just all ignore collectively ignore him. Hey, he's at he's at twenty percent. The uh, last person who was close to that he's not at twenty was Ross Perot. He's not at twenty percent. Uh, are you is, disputing the polls? I, I I think that's cherry picking his highest numbers. I don't think it's where he's averaging. Okay. Um, uh, so this is let's get into uh, a Twitter fight about it. So you know, re, so real clear politics polling average when it's just when it's just a three way, not even the five way, because they they sometimes do it with like Stein and um, a Libertarian three way. Candy's averaging twelve point three, not twenty. He, he 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 hit 21 in a Harris poll in January, and has not hit 20 cents. And um, has not hit 20 cents. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> uh, his highest in February was an 18. I mean, in fairness, here there's there's not a whole lot of polls that just do the three of them, so it's it's, it's a limited amount of data. But um, I guess the Harris one, basically, almost only Harris is doing it. Harris has him at 17 in their March poll. His average is being bogged down by um, an eight from Reuters. When you do the, the five way, um, so that includes Stein and Cornell West, then Kenny's at 9.9, so almost 10. Um, and he has, there's no poll in the five way when he's at, at 20. Now, a point that I've been making is that this is all ridiculous because we don't even know he's going to be anywhere near 50 states on the ballot. You, you can't put him in a national poll. He's not going to be available to vote for nationally. So I don't even think he should be in these polls until okay, he's... Okay, but that may be true. But there are like six... If he's on the ballot in, in Michigan... Pennsylvania, Ohio, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada. Then, then, I don't know. Then, then poll. Then poll in the states where he's actually on the ballot. He's not on the ballot in any of the states you just mentioned yet. But um, has but, it? Is it too late, or can he no, still? No, he's got time. He's got okay. time. But uh, I, as I point out, like you look at Ross Perot. Who, Ross Perot was the last independent who got in all fifty states. Libertarians get on. Have gone fifty states past couple cycles. So Tend to be that they're they're third party, not independent. Ross Perot was the first, last independent to get in all 50. And he was very clever. You know, I mean, he goes on Larry King in February 1992. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Not bad. Um, <laughs> and when he's asked, are you going to run? And he was like, well, you know, if you're really serious about it, you get me on the ballot. Let, let's see if you, you put some sweat into it. And people I- accept the offer. And so by, by April, They've collected way above the minimum number of signatures in in 15 states. 
Uh, they don't they don't turn them in yet because they're like we we want to break records. We want to really just drown the election offices in signatures. Uh, so right away you had a clear sign that he was on a good track, and not that, not, not that there weren't other legal challenges he had to overcome, but like it was a pretty good early barometer. Candy is nowhere near that right now. Uh, they only claim to have enough signatures in well, of, as far as his own efforts are concerned, in four states. I mean, he's only technically certified in one of them so far. Uh, and then you have the super PAC that did another four, but whether those signatures are going to be validated because there's charges of illegal coordination between the campaigns, that's up in the air. But even the most charitable, and I know some of those uh, super PAC ones, they say, we, have, we, we, we met the minimum requirement here, but they, they even got in, usually you get at least double the amount to anticipate some signatures being invalidated. They shared the numbers. They didn't. They didn't get double in two of their four states. Would it be extra charitable? They got signatures in eight states, and this is being at at it for a longer period of time than Ross Perot is at it at this stage of the game. So these guys. I mean, and then he picks a VP yesterday, Nicole Shanahan, who clearly is only being picked because she's sitting on a giant pile of money after marrying. Yeah. Uh, a Google founder who was literally worth $100 billion uh, divorced him last year. We don't know how much she got from it, but it, it, I, I, I think she she asked for $1 billion. We don't know if she got $1 billion or not, but clearly she, she doesn't have to go work again after this. Alleg- uh, allegedly had an affair with Elon Musk, which they both deny. Did, right. I mean, like, none of this is qualification to be in line for the presidency. Like, I see some of the commentary about this saying, oh, what a clever move by RFK for picking a, a billionaire or multimillionaire to help him bank world's ballot access project. The proper reaction is you don't pick someone to be second in line to the well, first in line to the presidency based on their checkbook. That's an, a total affront to democracy. This should make Kennedy, I mean, he's already an unserious candidate, in my opinion. But Doubly more so now. This is ridiculous. Uh, and now, mind you, as far as being in polls are concerned, I would still stick to my standard. If he's going to be on the ballots, then fine. You got to mention it. But just her checkbook isn't hard. I mean, Kennedy's not broke. Kennedy has been fundraising pretty well. Uh, the money hasn't been used well to organize a proper ballot signature operation, signature gathering operation. So. I don't think right, just let, let me just, play, devil, let me just play devil's advocate for a second, though, OK, because I could envision a scenario where third party candidates are kept off the polling, the national polling. And, you know, maybe Biden's up 51, 49 in the polls and everyone who's rooting for Biden feels pretty good. He's going to win. But what they don't realize, because it's not being polled, is that RFK. Junior is getting fifteen percent in Georgia, and well, in, if he's on the ballot in Georgia, go ahead and poll him in Georgia. If he's on the ballot there, but the um, national polls are what's going to drive the news, and well, it's going to it's going to create well, it's going to create a perception. But right now, we're getting a warped perception of the race because he's in national polling before he's actually earned the right to be nationals. Georgia people who filed paperwork to run for president. We don't put them in the polls. Just showing up isn't enough. Uh, and he's a weird case because, you know, I mean, Cornell West in these polls, he's getting, you know, 1%. Jill Stein's getting 1% or thereabouts. We all know Kenny's getting an inflated number because he's got a famous name. We can't easily discern what is, you know, superficial name ID and what is, I really b- love John uh, Robert Kennedy's vaccine conspiracies. Uh, so we're getting a totally warped perception of what the race actually is because a guy is being polled who is not going to be, or at least not yet, proven to be on the ballot nationwide. When you get on the ballot, or at least show me some clear evidence you're going to get on most ballots, then you get that privilege. Okay. Let me just ask this, and I know we got to run soon, but you've made the you you made a a, a pretty cogent uh, argument that he does not deserve to be in national polls. Do you agree with me that he poses a legitimate problem in terms of playing a spoiler and that he very well 
could stop Biden from winning uh, because in certain states he would take just enough votes to basically do what uh, some people think Ross Perot did to George H.W. Bush. Well, why I don't I think the exit poll data shows that Perot didn't do that. Perot was drawing evenly from the two. Uh, the, the, it's too early to say who can he draws from first. You know, sometimes I make these points and then people say, well, he's going to take more, more from Trump than Biden. Why are you shooting yourself in the foot? I'm like, here's a case where I'm going to say, that's not the point. It's not, that's a, I'm not saying it's just because I think he's going to hurt Biden. He, he may well hurt Trump more at the end of the day. And he might get more ballot access if he hooks up with the libertarians. Libertarians have a good yeah. track record of, of ballot access. He's clearly interested in it because I think, you know, it's his own operation. It's not, not up to snuff. But if he's a libertarian, maybe he pulls more from Republicans and Democrats even more so because it becomes even clearer that he's not really all that liberal. Uh, I, I think so. I think those I mean, the conventional wisdom right now is and I've written about this at The Daily Beast is these so-called double haters. There's about 19 percent of the vote who uh, don't like they're, they're dissatisfied with Trump and Biden. And a lot of these people have previously supported Trump or Biden. And now they're dissatisfied. And I think the general consensus is that people who are dissatisfied with Biden are more likely to come home to him. Whereas Trump, if you're pissed off at Trump, you're probably not coming. You're not as likely to change your mind about Trump. And if that's true, then the problem with a third party candidate is they, they give us an out. You don't like Trump. You don't like Biden. You don't have to come home. You you but, have another but, but, option. But your but your premise is that there's sort of there's more soft Biden than soft Trump, and therefore RFK is more of a threat to Biden. I mean, that might be true. We don't know it's true. I mean, I'm just this is obviously very anecdotal. It's just based on extremely online commentary. Uh, I can't know if that it's it has true for the end of the day. There are some people out there that are in this sort of weird uh, anti-vax uh, conspiracy space. So that Joe Rogan space that do seem to be toggling between Trump and Kennedy uh, and aren't like hardcore Trump cultists, but uh, but hate sort of the sense of, you know, the deep state and whatnot, therefore would never go for Joe Biden. And we really can't easily tell. I mean, there's always a certain number of people are going to vote for a third party or independent candidate who are never going to vote for the two parties in the first place. Yeah. Those folks are not lost voters to the two parties. The question is. Is there people who would have voted for a major party candidate if they didn't have a choice for a third party uh, option? Well, or I'm option? tempted to say that's a minuscule percentage of Americans, but then I'm reminded that Joe Rogan has millions and millions of, of viewers and listeners. So. Well, look, a million people in a country of 330 million is not that much at the end of the day when it comes to voting, uh, especially when you spread out over the country and how much does it matter in the swing states? So, like, there's a whole lot of you know data we can't have. At this stage of the race, we know that third party candidates, you know, they get overinflated early and they dwindle by the end. That's the typ typical trajectory of these things. Uh, and when you when you get down to the to election day, how many of those people really were gettable for the major party candidates and how many were never going to vote for them in the first place? Yeah, I don't know. And I don't know at the end of the day who is going to draw pull from more. Uh, uh, so it's a it's a it's a wild card factor. It's an X factor, uh, but to my mind, that's a it's not a question of me wanting to get him off the table because I think he's certainly going to hurt Biden. I don't know that's true. I just think he is warping our conversation, warping our understanding of where this race stands because he's getting he's getting outsized, unwarranted attention based on name ID and undeserved because. Being in national polls directly affects national media narrative. National media narrative is almost like 75% based on how they're doing a national poll. Uh, and so that becomes what we're talking about here. And, it, it, and I think it distracts from the race that we know we have, which is Trump v. Biden. We know they're on all 50 state ballots. We don't know Kennedy's on, on 40 ballots, let alone 50. And that goes the same for, for Stein and West. Now, Stein said the Greens have a pretty good track record getting on more than 40. They did it last time in the pandemic, but they did the last two times prior. 
So I'd be a little more charitable, including them. Cornell West, like he is like living off of chump change. Like he he has like not I don't even has two hundred thousand in the bank. Uh, so I think there's almost no chance he's on forty state ballots. Uh, and I'm even less inclined to include him uh, in, in national polls. But but because they keep getting included, we keep talking. So you end up talking about Biden's in trouble. These people are pulling from him. Because when you, when you include all three, he definitely comes out the worst for the wear of Joe Biden. But that, that may not be the race that we actually have in front of us. So it's, it's, it's warping our understanding of the race. All right. Good show. Long show or well over an hour. Um, two quick announcements, Bill. One. My, uh, if you like audio podcasts and you like hearing my interviews and punditry, uh, I was, you know, I was talking earlier about the interview with Tom Nichols. The Matt Lewis in the news audio feed is, I think, gone. Uh, it, I don't think it's coming back, at least. Uh, so if you like it, I have a new one. It's called Matt Lewis Can't Lose. So subscribe to Matt Lewis Can't Lose on iTunes or wherever, and you'll get all that audio content you used to get. Um, the other announcement is, barring unforeseen circumstances, I think we're going to have to take next week off as I'm doing a little traveling, including Bill. You'll like this. I am uh, among the places I'm visiting is the Woodrow Wilson Museum. Nice. In Virginia. So there'll be, I, I can't imagine how much content that will give us to talk about in two weeks when I return. <laughs> so I, you're going to be excited for that. So stay tuned. <laughs> Bill, what do you got? Um, well, if folks are interested, uh, tomorrow, Thursday, March 28th, I am moderating a panel at the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Library and Museum uh, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Indian Citizenship Act. And everybody knows that he signed the law that made all Native American citizens. I have a panel of uh, experts in Native American uh, history and culture talking about the impact of the act over the last 100 years. Uh, that's, so if you're in the North Haven area, you can come to the museum and see it live, but it, it will be live streamed on YouTube and available on YouTube after after the event. Otherwise, uh, check out my Washington Monthly Newsletter. My take on the RFK VP pick was, was published yesterday. And I got a column coming out tomorrow, so you have to wait and see what that's about uh, at washingtonmonthly.com. Very good. All right. We'll see you at some point back here in the D.